grab this. It's a little high for me. Good morning, everyone. How's it going? Good. Good. Not everyone is sounding worse for wear. Uh, okay. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Mitu Kandeka Kokoris. Uh, I'm a new faculty member here at the NYU Game Center. And uh, I'm also an indie developer. And I'm super excited to introduce our next speaker to you, because I think those of us who make indie games actually have a lot to owe to her. Um, as one half of MetaNet software, uh, she was kind of an indie developer before being an indie developer was really a thing as we know it. Um, so I think we can really uh, consider her to be a true trailblazer in the world of indie games. Um, and uh, as someone who really helped carve out and define that path. So after MetaNet's brilliantly successful flash game N uh, back in 2004, they went on to release its sequel, N Plus, uh, for Xbox Live Arcade um, in 2008. And, uh, and that was massively successful, of course. It was a great game. And she really used that success in order to do great, uh, great work in advocating for and, in and encouraging uh, just sort of greater diversity in games and greater representation of those who are often underrepresented in games. Um, and I think we can really thank her in many ways for helping to define the sort of safe space if, uh, for making games. Um, so the Hand-Eye Society, the Video Games Arts Festival uh, organization, rather, which she co-founded along, uh, along with a number of others, um, has been doing really great, important work, ongoing work, in, uh, in really helping to think about games as creative expression through their various initiatives, um, from like the Wordplay Festival through to, um, through to Game Curious, uh, so helping bring uh, games literacy to those who don't necessarily identify uh, as gamers. Um, so I've been aware of her work for a while, but I was fortunate enough to meet her for the first time uh, in Toronto for Feminists in Games 2012. Um, and I think she's really sort of helped uh, define Toronto as like a great place for games. Um, and since meeting her, I've sort of come to think of her as uh, just someone with great taste and uh, really great aesthetic sensibility because she's always the person popping up on my various social media feeds uh, linking to great examples of architecture and industrial design and and fashion um, and uh, and you know and, and as a part of uh, and as part of expressing that um, she uh, also designed a great line of n plus plus scarves one of which I'm wearing right now um, so uh, so yeah, I think speaking of N++, uh, so that was released earlier this year for P PS4, and I just think it's such a beautiful, inspirational um, example of the value of long-term iterative design um, and what it means to really perfect your craft as a game designer. So but without further ado, I would love to welcome her to the stage and share with us all her incredible accumulated wisdom from working on a game which has been 11 years in the making. Everyone please join me in welcoming the wonderful, fantastic Mayor Shepherd. Thank you so much, Mitsu. That was like probably the best introduction I will ever get anywhere. Um, that was amazing. Um, so yes, I am Mayor. I'm half of MetaNet, and the other half of MetaNet is Reagan Burns, who's right over there. And so the two of us together have been making levels on and off since 2004. So thank you so much for coming, and thank you so much to Practice for having me here to discuss our process and talk about designing levels for you know a decade and what what we've been doing basically. So this is only an hour and there is a lot to cover so I could not fit everything in um, and I'm only going to talk about solo level design today. We also did some multiplayer level design but that's a whole other kettle of fish. So if there's anything that you feel I skimmed over and you want to know more just please feel free to get in touch. Okay so who here has played N or N plus or N plus plus? Okay, lots of people. So even though this talk is about level design, I want to start by talking about the game design briefly because obviously game design has a huge influence on level design. So here is N++. It is a stylish 2D action puzzle platformer where you control a tiny ninja who can run and jump. So this video is of a new player playing through uh, the first set of levels in N++, and the next one's going to be an expert player playing through the last set of levels. 
So you don't really get a sense of what it feels like to play this game, and that's part of what makes it so special, how it feels to play. Um, so please do play it if you haven't already. And there's an event at Baby Castles tonight that I will mention again later. You should totally come and try it. Um, but anyway, hopefully these videos give you an idea of what the game is and how it works. So there are thousands of levels in the game, and each one was painstakingly handcrafted by Reagan and I, which I will be describing in great detail. Um, and in each level, you're just, you need to get to that switch to open the exit and then get to the exit alive, just like that. Levels are grouped into sets of five that we call episodes, and that lets us give sort of a dramatic arc to the levels. You have 90 seconds to beat all five levels in an episode, and collecting gold increases your time, which is also your score, and it's represented by that yellow timer bar at the top. And you can't attack enemies, you can only avoid them, but you can manipulate their behavior to get around them. So, everybody in this room knows, but I'm just gonna say this anyway so that we're all on the same page. The game's design is the set of rules, entities, behaviors, and relationship that makes up the game. And implicitly, it defines all the things that can happen in the game. So our job as level designers is to explore that huge possibility space that's latent in the game design and discover various arrangements of elements which produce interesting experiences for the player to engage with. And we need to develop a deep understanding and knowledge of these elements and experiences in order to combine them in intriguing ways. So I'm going to explain how we did this in M++. So first, I just need to go over the basic gameplay rules so that we can talk about how they influence the design possibilities. M++ uses only three buttons, run left, run right, and jump. But we managed to do a lot with them. So the thing that makes M++ different from other platformers is the movement model. Movement is the essence of a platformer. It's the core of the genre, and it has a huge influence on level design. So the movement model that we created in N++ is a bit different. And that's part of the reason that we were able to make so many levels. So in most platformers, movement is trivial. If you want to go left, you press left, and then you're instantly running left. If you want to jump, you press jump, and you're jumping. And that's really all there is to it. But in N++, the controls aren't that direct. So the ninja has a lot of inertia, and it takes several seconds to change direction or to reach your top speed. And your top speed is quite high. You can outrun most enemies in the game. But this basically makes it feel more like a driving game where you're constantly adjusting your velocity and you have to develop a feel for your vehicle's momentum. So it's a pretty different experience for a platformer. So as a player, you always have to be anticipating the future state of the world instead of just relying on twitch reflexes. Jumping is also a bit different in M++. So instead of a single jump arc, you can choose between two types of jump by pressing left or right as you jump. So if you're on an angled surface, you can jump forward uphill or perpendicular outward from the hill. And if you're on a wall, you can jump up the wall or you can jump away from the wall. So this is why level design matters, because it affects what jumps are available to the player. These jumping mechanics require learning and experience to develop a feel for, but once you master them, they give you a tremendous amount of fine-grained control. So in Mario, your horizontal velocity affects your jump height. So you can jump higher by running faster. But in M++, your vertical velocity determines your jump height. And you can, you can kind of combine that with wall jumping to create a sort of feedback loop where you can build up a huge amount of upwards momentum if you time your jumps right. Okay, so the last thing about movement is, in most platformers, your character's collision shape is a box, and you move in pixel-sized increments. But in N++, the ninja is a circle, and you move in fractions of a pixel. So this makes collision detection a lot more precise, which gives you access to a wider range of movement possibilities as a player. Plus, we tuned gravity and the simulation speed so that things feel a bit slow-mo, and it's easier to use that precision. So as a result, you can develop your skills to the point where you can pull off incredibly specific maneuvers and narrowly slip between enemies to fit into tiny little spaces. There are also various expert techniques that evolve out of this, like corner jumping that we never require you to use to beat the game, but it's just that there's this whole range of new techniques um, and opportunities that you can kind of unlock once you've mastered the basics. And again, only three buttons. So. 
for players, N++ is, I mean, the movement in it is a performance that you need to learn and master. And this is really the foundation of level design. So our goal as designers is to have a deep understanding of how to control the ninja, how to teach that control to players, and then to provide them with a variety of different contexts and motivations so that they can apply what they've learned and test and expand the boundaries and really explore their knowledge and skill. OK, so I've talked about the tiles and the movement. Next up, enemies and objects. So these are obviously other important tools that we can use in the game to determine where the player can go and what they can do. So mines are a staple in N++. They're those little red dots. Um, and they're static. They're passive. And they fine tune the possibilities that we've defined with the tiles. Drones, which are those turquoise um, kind of roundish things on the left in the middle, are driven by time, and the player has no control over them. So they're mostly used to generate different patterns and rhythms of available and unavailable space. The other enemies in the game are all driven in some way by the ninja's position. They provide motivation for movement for the player. So they do this by seeking or chasing or shooting. But they basically force the players to move. And this movement is constrained by the tiles and the mines and all the other enemies. So negotiating this constantly shifting set of constraints is the main activity that players are performing. Toggle mines and evil ninjas, are, uh, which are in the lower left corner of this level, are a bit special. So they're overtly about the player's past actions, changing the available future actions. So because they change when you touch them, they transform the areas of the level that the ninja has already passed through, which is interesting. And I will come back to that later as well. OK, so then there are the objects that are all tools that either shape the space the ninja can move through or let the player manipulate the ninja's motion through, I guess, beyond what's normally available just running and jumping. So there are launch pads that shoot you into the air, bounce blocks that can slingshot you, boost pads accelerate you in whatever direction you were going as you move through them. There are one-way platforms that block your movement in one direction. And then there are various doors that you can lock and unlock. So because the enemy and object behaviors all relate to the ninja's position, each level is essentially a mechanism that's indirectly controlled by the player as they move the ninja. And as designers, we need to make sure it's intriguing and interesting to navigate and manipulate that mechanism. One major way that we do that in N++ is that we try to add many paths or routes through the levels so that players have options and they can find what works for them, which is a different kind of challenge than most hard platformers, which tend to prefer a single fixed route through the level that players just have to execute perfectly. So these routes are a really important part of how we design levels, and I will definitely go into a lot of detail on that. So. Each level in M++ is basically like a puzzle. But as a player, you don't really have to stop and think about it. It's more that it's your, your practical knowledge is constantly being tested, both in terms of how to move through the level, as well as what's possible with respect to movement, given the nearby tiles and objects. So the last part of the game that I want to talk about is the single screen presentation. So each level in N++ is all on one screen. And this contributes to the puzzle element. It's a puzzle platformer. And it lets players see the entire self-contained level all, all at once at a glance. So the graphics of the game need to support the design for both to work really well. And we design the graphics of N++ to encourage players to learn how to read a level really quickly so that they can figure out what they think they can do and you know, figure out what the possibilities are, and then start planning their route through the level. So we chose a minimal visual aesthetic for N++, which is extremely functional and as stylish as possible, um, because the game is so challenging. And we need to make sure that we don't overly distract players, because that makes it frustrating rather than enjoyable. So making the state of the world obvious and clear also lets us push the complexity of the level designs to extremes that would be way too hard to read if the graphics were any more ornate. So here's an example of what I mean by that. This level is very complex. Each one of those tiny little blue drones, which are called micro drones, will kill you if you touch it. So this is the sort of thing that just would not work if the graphics were any more complicated. Um, because it pushes right up to the limits of what you're able to parse and focus on as a player. 
So that's the basic game design. Now we can get into the level design, which is, for me, the exciting part. So I want to talk about our process for designing variety, aka how do we keep players interested when there are thousands of levels? So our basic process is we make levels, we test them, we revise them, we refine them, and retest them. And then when we think they're pretty good, we rank them for difficulty and then order them into episodes and arrange the episodes into a grid. And then we pretty much just edit and refine levels right up until we ship them. The first step in this level design pipeline is coming up with new ideas. So making levels was something that we did constantly throughout the entire project. Sometimes we did it for months at a time, and sometimes we just did that whenever we had a free day. Um, but Reagan and I do this individually rather than together, though we do pass progr in progress ideas back and forth. And that's pretty useful, because if one person is stuck on how to make a design work, often the other person has fresh eyes and different ideas about how to approach it. So the main way that we find new ideas is just by sketching and playing around in the editor and seeing what happens. So the idea for that is we sort of gradually learn the nuances of the game's design through play. The process is enjoyable and low stress, and we just develop and expand our vocabulary naturally. So here is a level where the idea is you're these um, the sort of boxes that are traveling from right to left are called thwumps. So you're going to need to ride these thwumps across the level and avoid all the mines and micro drones and everything else that's trying to kill you. It's very, it's quite a difficult level. I mean, they sort of all are, but this one especially. <laughs> so here's how we made this level, step by step. So we basically started out, we knew we wanted to use these thwumps to have you ride across the level. We just needed to figure out what position they, they should be in, what feels good, and then build the rest of the level around it, creating interesting experiences and things for you to avoid and situations for you to get yourself out of. So what you're not seeing here is after every single step or every significant step, we play test. So you're seeing every frame, but between each frame is a play test session where we, we try everything and see if it worked or see if it needs further refining. It's a very long process. Um, okay, here's another level. This one is about moving through a big open space and, I guess, trying to escape from a whole bunch of death balls, which are those purple things that are coming after the ninja now. So this one, I mean, it's relatively simple, but they swarm and they interact in interesting ways so that uh, avoiding them is a little bit more complex than it first seems. So here is step by step of making that level. You can see we, we knew we wanted a bunch of death balls, big open space, and most of the steps in the process are just refining the tiles, adding some mines and gold, and generally creating a process that the player will have to move through. So our goal in M++ is to create levels that are as different from each other as possible. And that makes it so that the game is interesting and varied, and it doesn't really get old that fast. So the ways that levels can be different are the difficulty of the level, the length or duration of the level, the types of movement required on the part of the player, like is it mostly vertical or horizontal or a mix, the, uh, whether there are lots of angled surfaces or lots of flat surfaces, the types and combination of enemies and objects in the level, the various types of pacing, like whether the level peaks at the beginning or the middle or the end, the skills required on the part of the player, like do you need to have great reflexes, or do you need to be good at higher level planning, or do you just need to be really patient? Um, the types of space in the level, where, whether it's wide open or has more narrow hallways. The use of space in the level, like is it, this one's a there and back, this one is more linear, or sometimes there are big open unstructured spaces and things like that. So there are lots of possibilities. And in order to create levels that are as different as possible from each other, we try to approach level design from as many different ways as we can as well. Because we find that the process really influences the results. And you never know where inspiration will come from, so we try to be open-minded. Sometimes we start with an evocative level name and just try to imagine what sort of level might match that name. Sometimes we look to architecture and we find that the exteriors of buildings are often as you know, a rich source of shapes as are the floor plans. Uh, sometimes there are happy accidents while you're making another level. And sometimes we just play around with tiles and sketch in the editor until we find an interesting space to move through. So we have lots of strategies. 
Something else that we've found useful is to have an in-progress file, which for us right now is filled with thousands of levels. Um, but often an initial idea won't totally work, but there's something that's interesting that you can learn from or build on. So here's an example of an in-progress sketch, and you can see it's not finished. We were playing around with a grid of mines and bounce blocks, toggle patterns, and just like trying to figure out what movement possibilities exist in this level. But something wasn't quite right, so we just left it. And it's great because making new stuff from scratch feels really different from working uh, with in-progress fragments. Is when you're trying to fix or rearrange things, it's a completely different sort of creative challenge than making something new. So you can alternate between those two approaches and you don't get as tired. So here is an example of a sketch that was in progress for a bit and then we refined it and added to it and put it in the game. So this is what we started with. It's very plain, you know, there's a simple space, a couple of objects, some lasers at the bottom. And then we worked with it for a bit and built around that space. You can kind of see the, the remnants of that space in the tiles, but we've added a lot more objects and a lot more for the player to do. And then here is how it looks in the final game. Quite different. So having a file of in-progress ideas makes it easy and fun to freely try new things because you don't really have to be inhibited about it. You don't have to stress out about an idea working or not or get too hung up on making it work because if it doesn't, you just throw it in the bin and then you can come back to it later. In practice, most of the in-progress levels don't make it out of the bin, but psychologically, it's nice to have it there so that you don't feel bad about failing or giving up on new ideas. And especially when you're dealing with this volume of work, um, it's being productive is about managing your expectations and trying to keep yourself motivated. And having that freedom to just scrap an idea when it's not working really helped us keep things moving and smoothly flowing. Okay, so once a level is good enough and the idea is solid, we sit down and go through it together. So whoever made the level, the other person would play through it. And it's a really fun dynamic because you sort of naturally want to impress or surprise the other person. Overall, we approach level editing as a collaboration and we pass things back and forth and we discuss the problems that we see or changes that we think should be made. Um, together. And we find that it's a terrific method for generating a diverse and varied set of levels because we're both individuals and we both have our own tastes and interests and we can team up to cover a much wider range and compensate for each other's weaknesses or blind spots. So the main focus of the early review together is to rank the difficulty and rate the quality of each level, which is data that we later use when we're arranging them into episodes. So our quality rating was very simple. It's a scale from one, oh sorry, zero to two, and it's based on the specialness of a level, which is just, does this level stand out from other levels? It's very subjective, it's just a gut feeling. So here is an example of a zero level. It's fun, but it's repetitive and monotonous. And we would need to edit a bit more to add some variation or to change things up in the bottom there. So it either needs more work or we need to cut it. This is an example of a one quality level. So it's relatively plain and simple, but it has a lot of fun, varied options for movement, and it looks nice. It's good, it's solid, but it's not exceptional. But most importantly, this is great. It doesn't need to be any better than this because you don't want all your levels to be twos. As a player and as a designer, that gets exhausting. So dynamics are super important in level design because like in music, where the quiet parts of a song help the loud parts to feel even louder, Relatively ordinary levels like this one help the exciting ones feel even more exciting. So speaking of exciting, this is a two level. So it's very different, there's a lot going on, it's relatively long, and it features two completely different sections, one of which is entirely optional. So this is a great level. Um, this is our difficulty scale. It goes from zero to seven, um, and it's based on our estimate of the skill and knowledge required to beat the level. So this too is completely subjective. We just vote and then we average the results. And we don't really get too hung up on finding the perfect rating right off the bat, which is also important because if you try to make things perfect all at once, you sort of grind to a halt. So we find it works to just make things better incrementally and eventually you get close enough to perfection. Okay. The next step in the pipeline is editing. This is the main level design task in M++. 
So we constantly play through the entire archive of thousands of levels, refining them and improving them and cutting. Playtesting like that constantly led to our tough but fair level design style uh, because we play through the levels so many times as we make them. So anything that's overly frustrating or unfair naturally gets smoothed out because those sections would annoy us and then we would fix or cut them. The idea behind our editing process is that N++ levels are really short. Uh, most of them take less than a minute to beat in the game. So it gets really exhausting and boring to work on the same level for hours at a time. So we took our cues from playing the game and instead we split the hours of editing into many, many different small passes, iterating quickly over all the levels again and again, rather than doing a few large passes. So we focused on one specific task at a time because we find that as you work on that one task over thousands of levels, you get really good at understanding the nuances of it. And if you are constantly switching focus because you're looking at so many different issues on one level, you might never really develop that much insight. And when you return to a level on the next pass, which is after a lot of time, you're fresher and you notice things that you might have missed if you had been grinding on it for an hour all at once. But one warning about this iterative approach is that you kind of can end up overcooking things sometimes. Um, near the end of development, we reviewed all the levels and we noticed that a lot of the beautiful simplicity and the elegance that we really love had been lost. And things weren't really that minimal anymore because we just mess with them too much. So here's an example of that. This is Occam's laser. And the initial level is based around a series of jumps. There are some lasers on the right hand side that interfere with your jumps and force certain timings. So we played with this level a lot and we added a lot of variety. And we kept adding more and more and more until that nice simple idea was totally lost. So we dialed it back a bunch and we kept the, the kind of seed of the original idea with some of the variation that we added later. And here is what it looks like in the game. So having good tools can be a lifesaver in this regard because our level archive contained all previous versions of each level. So we were able to go through them and make a case by case decision about which levels to revert and which levels to keep. Um, and one thing to note, I mean, these edits, we got a bit carried away with them, but for us it actually turned out to be a good thing because it, it helped to inspire the secret levels that I'm really excited about and we'll get to shortly. Okay, so level design is like cooking in that you have to constantly taste what you're making to know how it's coming together. But that also makes you get used to the flavor. And we've been playing for more than 10 years, so that makes it really hard for us to keep an objective perspective on the difficulty of a level. But difficulty, of course, is something that you want to be able to craft and sculpt and control. So it's really important to have a good understanding of it so that you can use it effectively as a tool. So we have a number of strategies for that. And one is showing the game during development at events. And our experience with showing the game is that we watch horrified as no one can make it through, even the easiest levels. And so we go home and we make everything a lot easier. And then the same thing happens at the next show and the next show. But eventually we've refined it to a point where all of that stuff is smoothed out. Okay, the last important step in making levels is naming the level. So we find that meaningful level names are a way for us to add more dimension to a level, give the player cues, and to make the experience generally more rich than like level number 853. So this is Bullshit Mountain. <laughs> and <laughs> we really like this name. It's unique, it's silly, and it signals something to the player. So there are a lot of really tricky parts in this level, and the title lets players know that's intentional. It's not a mistake. Um, and hopefully also it kind of undercuts the frustration that they will feel with a little bit of levity. So the ninja here is coming up to one of the most frustrating parts. Right here. <laughs> so that's the, those are the basics. Now I can get into the more complex, fun stuff about level design. So as we make levels, 
We try to consider what the player is thinking and feeling as they play. And Reagan and I try to be sympathetic to the player, but at the same time, we want to challenge them as much as possible because ultimately we want them to succeed and feel really proud of their hard-earned skills. Because that's what's fun about this game. It feels very satisfying to get through those challenges that you're up against. So, oh, and also it's not really just one player, right? It's a whole range of players. So in order to accommodate that range from you know, total noobs to 10-year veteran fans, we designed multiple routes through each level. So this is Trivium Reactor, and this is the just beat it route. So this is the easiest route. All you have to do is nothing fancy, just get the switch, get to the exit alive. So I will say there's a line drawn in this diagram, but it's really more, uh, there's more looseness and freedom along the route. Um, not a specific line that you have to stay on, so that players have some flexibility and agency. They can choose what jumps they want to do, they can choose when to do them. They can make it their own. So this is the easiest route, and we try to support a range of just beat the level routes, which happens naturally a lot of the time. Because if you don't constrain the solution too much, expert players naturally try to blaze through a level really fast, and novice players can move through them slowly and relatively safely. So this, we think, is really cool because it lets players modulate the difficulty themselves in an organic way, and they feel empowered to do that. Oh yeah, sorry about that, that message. Okay, this is the next path. This is the all gold path. So in N++, we added a badge that we give you when you collect all the gold in the level. And we designed these routes as a bonus for advanced players, either to make their first playthrough more exciting or as a sort of extra challenge that they can return to after they beat the game. In practice, most people just try to go for that right off the top, which is, I mean, it's really tough, but it's a, it's a challenge. So, but we think this is interesting because, again, it gives players agency. It's a difficulty mode that you don't have to choose from a menu. You can just try for the all gold and then abandon your plan if it's not working out. All gold routes are typically longer and more difficult than just beating the level. And so here, the all gold route requires you to go twice around the entire level. And there's a pretty tricky jump right up there at the top. So some of the all gold challenges are already notorious among fans and they're marathon tests of skill and patience and stress management, really. <laughs> so for example, this is the lunatic device and it's, it's another uh, way for us to signal to the player what they're in for with the level name. So beating the level is actually pretty easy, but if you do want the old gold badge, you have to wind your way through these multiple uh, terrifying strands of drones that they, I mean, it's just very difficult to get every single piece of gold in there. This one took man versus game three entire hours to beat. And um, I do have a clip of him beating it, but there's no sound, so I'm just gonna let you watch it anyway. He gets very excited. <laughs> It is, <laughs> it's even better with sound. <laughs> I'll try to put it online or something. Um, okay, so this is the last route that I want to talk about. This is the secret challenge path. So secret challenges were something that we invented in N++. It, th we're very excited about them, and I'm going to talk about those next. But these are extreme challenges. They're uh, for expert players, and they're kind of hidden in plain sight within the level themselves. So secret challenges are only unlocked once you've beat the game and you've collected a lot of all gold badges. And they force players to unlearn their previous successful routes through the level and to try to approach it in a completely different way. So in this example, the secret challenge is to touch all of the toggle mines without touching any of the gold and figuring out how to do that involves a kind of a sneaky trick because one of the mines in the top right is slightly misplaced so there's a slightly larger gap that you can just get through and we only use this slightly misplaced object trick twice in 600 levels so it's not something that players are expecting but when they see it and when they figure out what it means it's very satisfying <laughs> that person just gave up I guess 
Okay, so now I'm going to talk a bit more about secret challenges because we're very excited and proud of them and they're new, so there's still that novelty factor. Okay, so these are some videos from YouTube. Sorry about the quality. They're a streamer doing some of the secret challenges. And in both videos, the challenge is touch all the toggle mines without collecting any of the gold. And you can see that the routes are incredibly difficult and they really require moving around the levels in ways that feel almost wrong. So what happened was, we sometimes got bored while testing levels and we started inventing weird goals like, I wonder if I could beat this level without touching any of the gold or I wonder if I could toggle all the mines and survive. So that turned out to be pretty interesting. The secret challenges came out of finding those hidden potentialities in each level and then polishing them into fun experiences. So the secret challenges and secret levels were something that we added for hardcore fans, but also for ourselves because they're so weird and different. They gave us a reason to be excited about the game even after 11 years. A lot of the time, secrets in games don't really have a lot to do with the game itself. It's just kind of an unrelated surface layer. But we wanted to follow the example of Super Mario World secrets, which show how magical and transformative it can be when the secrets are integrated into the very core of the game itself. So we have secret challenges that emerge from the level design. And then there are the secret levels, which are unlocked when you beat enough secret challenges. So just like the um, special world in Super Mario World, secret levels in N++ are dramatically different than the regular levels, and they subvert all the you know, ordinary design rules that we use and let us push everything to the extreme. So N++ secret levels are all remixes of existing levels. And like I mentioned before, when we were editing, uh, we realized that we'd sort of taken it too far in some cases and destroyed that elegant minimalism that we love. But the new stuff that we were doing was also kind of cool. It was just a bit weird. So the secret levels were a way for us to take these weird offshoots, push them even further, and then give them a place in the game. So for example, here is a normal level. This is Orbital Habitat. We liked the way this one looked. We liked the way it felt to move through it. It's relatively simple, but there are a couple of interesting things that you can do. So after editing, we added a whole bunch of different flourishes, and it's fun, but it sort of destroyed that initial, you know, simple elegance. So in the game, we reverted to the old version, but then when we were making the secret levels, we took this overcooked version, and we kept going with it until it looked like this. So this is the secret level version of that level, called Decayed Orbital Colony. And it's way more complicated, it's not minimal at all, and the all gold and secret challenge routes are incredibly devious and long and huge challenges. They require some tricky moves and some sequence breaking to successfully complete them, but that's part of what makes them so exciting. So our process for making secret levels was totally different than for making regular levels, which helped a lot to make them feel special. The process is super important. So we started by stripping out everything from a regular level but the tiles, and then we would play with them, manipulate them in some way. We rotated them, we copied and pasted them. We just sort of played around to see what ideas came out of it. And this approach really felt different because it turned level design into kind of a puzzle or a game. Like if you have this set of tiles, what can you come up with? What can you do that's interesting? So here's an example of a secret level where we took the original, inverted it, flipped it, and then used that as the basis for the secret level. So this is actually the last level in the game. It's a really tricky sequence puzzle, and there are several different options in terms of where you can jump to and from, but all the sequences but one will end up trapping you on the way back. So it's a very difficult puzzle, requires some corner jumping and expert techniques, and only three people in the entire world have beaten this level. <laughs> So since the foundation of each secret level was already there from other tiles, we put our time into making extremely complex and involved enemy and object designs, and especially for the all gold and secret routes. So here is an example of making a secret level. We start with an original level and then we just kind of play around with it. We try different things, we develop it in different directions, and we just see what works. And again, we're play testing after each step. Um, and then the final version of the secret level only vaguely resembles the original. 
Um, this one took a really long time to test because it's very intricate and very difficult. And what's really fun about it is that there are so many options and sequences of events, so many things that you can do. It's very bewildering, but that's kind of refreshingly different from ordinary levels. Okay, so that's the practical stuff, but there is a thoughtful side to level design as well. And we think that that's what helps to make the game and the levels memorable. So as we design levels, we try to think about why people are playing and what they might be thinking. And our philosophy is that levels are a sort of conversation you're having with the player. We want that player, the conversation to be playful and intriguing and open and loose, but never bullying or mean. So this is where repetition comes in, um, because it can help players learn without being constantly frustrated by allowing them to recognize situations that they've been in before and apply their skills. You just need to be careful that the repetition is more theme and variation rather than just the exact same thing over and over. So this is an example of repetition that feels different. So the two bottom hallways are pretty similar. There's some gold, there's a floor chaser, there's some toggle mines, but the position of the gold and the length of the hallway are enough to make it feel like a different experience each time. Another strategy that we use to generate interesting repetition is to make sibling levels. Uh, and this is sort of two different takes on the same basic idea. So here is an example of the easy sibling in this example. So there's some mines, some gold, two evil ninjas that you're going to have to double back through one time in this level. It's relatively short, pretty simple. And this is the hard version. You can see the tiles are very similar. Some mines, some gold, two evil ninjas. But in this case, you have to double back through the evil ninjas a couple times. The gold is very difficult to collect, and obviously it's a lot longer. But in both, the skills required to beat this level are essentially the same. So to keep repetition from being boring, we vary the context each time the player revisits a space. So because of gravity, moving up through a space automatically feels very different than moving down through the space. But horizontal movement is symmetrical, so it's important to use enemy placement patterns and other things to break up the symmetry so that each leg of the journey feels like you're moving through a different space. So here's an example. The two vertical ascents on the left and right are the same tiles, so we use the the spacing of the mines, we offset it differently in each case to make each one require a slightly different approach. And in the center, we vary the context to make that space feel different. So the micro drones patrol counterclockwise around the room. So on the way there, it's easy because you can just go with the flow. But on the way back, it is challenging because you're moving against the current. So even though we reuse that space twice, it feels like a completely different room each time you're in it. Another way to ease frustration is we give players choices. So we try to make sure that players are only rarely forced to move quickly through the entire level, because it's nice to leave some space for them to move at their own pace and breathe a little. This freedom really lets players express themselves and find their own paths, which is a lot more enjoyable than a more constrained design. Plus, it leaves room for speedrunners, which is also fun. So here's an example of giving the player a lot of freedom. There are a series of challenges, one after another, but there is space between each of them to pause, and there's not really a real need to rush through them unless that's what you want to do. So part of the challenge of N++ is that players need to be responsive to the demands of the level and to develop that skill of reading the level to see what's possible to do. We think that engaging this sort of higher level contextual awareness is just as important as the basic muscle memory reflex skills so that all parts of the brain are involved and learning because that's what Reagan and I find most interesting as players. So as designers, we need to understand the ninja's behavior right out to the extreme so that we can use that. So I mentioned that the ninja has a wide range of speeds and a high top speed, and we try to use that as much as possible. We want players to be constantly negotiating and maneuvering within the range of possible trajectories because it's much more fun than just like holding the button down and running at top speed the entire time. So although we usually stay within the middle of the range, sometimes we require players to hit the ninja's behavioral extremes so that they don't become complacent and also so that the entire range is useful. So here's an example where 
The first jump needs to be taken at max speed. You've got to hold the jump button down the whole time so that you can be sure that you clear that gap. But the second jump changes things up, and it looks very similar. So inexperienced players might be tempted to approach it just like the top jump. But if you try that, you go too far, and you hit the mines right above the exit, just like this. But if you don't jump hard enough, then you fall short and smash into the ground. So you have to perform this very delicate modulation of velocity in midair to make sure that you land safely, but it's very satisfying when you nail it. So we also try to consider player psychology, especially understanding the various amounts of tension through a level and how that affects the pacing of the level. So in this example, the top part is very difficult. You have to weave through multiple Evil Ninja clones of yourself. You can't touch the ground. You can only jump on these platforms. And you rapidly run out of platforms to jump on. So it's very difficult. But the bottom is relatively easy. But since you probably died a lot and spent a lot of time and effort clearing that top section, that uh, you don't want to have to do that again. So that contextual stress follows you into the bottom. And it makes that part feel a lot more exciting than it it maybe really is. And part of the motivation behind the design of the Toggle Mine and Evil Ninjas, which are new in N++, is that they provide us with more tools to reuse a space. So these enemies are modified by the player, and they allow players to influence the difficulty and challenge of the level as they play. So this lets players intuitively connect their ninja with the mechanics of the level, and it also adds to the interest, because when they return to a space, it's a bit different, and they had a hand in changing it, which we think is pretty cool. So understanding and supporting or subverting player expectations is a really important part of making great, memorable levels. And it helps players really connect with the game in a meaningful way by making them part of the conversation. Our biggest goal is always to support player agency by rewarding learning and growth. We want players to be choreographers as well as performers. We want them to plan a route and then execute their plan, often on the fly, rather than just being forced to execute a sequence of moves that we as level designers preordain. So here's an example of giving the player a lot of options. Um, we made sure that you can pick any pair of those switches, which are those little squares, and uh, create one jump that passes through two of them at the same time. So it's very difficult, but very rewarding. Or you can just get each switch individually, but you still need to figure out an order, because that rocket makes that specific order matter. Um, it, it changes positions, and that changes what trajectories you have access to as a player. So there's an incredible amount of freedom in terms of how you want to tackle this challenge with a sort of combinatorial explosion of branching possibilities. And N++ le levels are about players finding their path through it rather than the path through it. Ultimately, level design in N++ is about creativity within constraints. So with a fixed small set of entities and tiles and a fixed single screen to work with, we could really get into and understand all the nuances and details of each component and how they interact. So that really let us create a variety of levels to challenge and reward players and to refresh the series with a couple of new ideas that really feel like they belong in the game's design, which is ultimately what we think keeps players coming back even after 11 years. OK, here are some things that I thought would relate to games other than N++. And yeah, that's, uh, I think that's all I have time to talk about today. But if you do want to get in touch, here's my email and Twitter and also Reagan's. And yeah, thank you so much. Yay. You talked about um, taking inspiration from outside sources, like architecture for the level design, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to talk to you about movement briefly. So I know you started doing ballet, right? Yes. Um, and as part of uh, Designing the Stars, you uh, did a photo series uh, photographing ballerinas. Can you talk about that and how that influenced how you think about movement in Everest? Absolutely. So I brought some of the images from that so that you can see them. Um, oh, God. Okay, 
I guess that's the best I could do. But anyway, so um, yeah, I made these scarves um, using N++ levels. But the idea behind this photo series was I wanted to visualize what it feels like to play the game, like what it feels like to be a ninja. Because like I said, you don't really get that good an impression of how it feels to play this game just from screenshots or video. So I really wanted to make something that had motion and had you know, the beauty and the, the feel of moving around the level. And we find that the, when you're you know, trying to avoid a rocket, it is kind of like a dance and there's this kind of overwhelming beauty that I can see in the game that I really wanted to try to convey in an interesting way so that other people could see what I mean. Um, and I wanted to also try to show and celebrate some of the diversity in my life and the amazing people around me. So while I was taking ballet, I met all of these dancers who were in the studio. And, you know, we just got to be friends. And they're it's amazing to me how people can because I, you know, sit at my desk for most of the day and I program and stuff like that, but these people can do amazing things with just their limbs. They can make compelling stories. They can tell a story just by moving around in such a graceful and beautiful way. And I just found that very inspiring. And it's something that I am, you know, maybe one day I'll be able to do that too. In the meantime, I've, I've still got my day job, which is good. <laughs> but it just let me... It was kind of, it just clicked. I was looking for a way to talk about the game that was more visual and a bit different than a way that we'd been talking about it before. And everything just kind of fell into place. That's great, thank you, Matt. Okay, I'll take some other questions. Um, okay, over here, yes. Uh, you, you've been making levels for this game for about 10 years or more, and uh, you released a level editor with the Antos Plusk. Yep. Did you see anything that people made that completely opened, like, see a new mechanic, a mechanic in a completely new way that yeah. you haven't encountered before? Yeah, it's great. Um, I mean, people always approach things from a completely different angle than you do as a designer. And I guess maybe also that they approach things in ways that we don't expect. So while we're focusing on, because we have kind of a house design style that we've been refining over the years. So we don't really use um, a lot of entities all at once. Um, people do that a lot, but it it's interesting to, so people created this, the don't do anything levels where you don't actually press anything. You just are propelled through the level by the physics and the objects and things like that, which we had never even thought of. And it must take hours to create and if they get very complicated it's it's amazing so that was one thing that really really impressed us but people just find interesting ways to use all of the entities in like things that we never even predicted did corner jumping like i don't think we knew about that i think some someone we were watching replays because there's a level editor in all versions of the game but there are also replays so you can always watch someone's high scores and in m plus plus we added high scores for each level that users create as well so now we can see all the cool tricks that people pull off um right in the game rather than having to go to youtube or whatever but so people um invented these incredibly specific very difficult expert techniques like corner jumping, which you have to execute, you only have about two or three frames to execute them. So it's very, very hard, but it just gives you a boost. You can jump, you know, maybe double the height that you normally can. So things like that were really interesting to see too. Not only how people use the entities, but how they were able to propel themselves around the level in ways that we didn't even know you could do. Yeah, so one of the things that we really need to be able to do is know that entire range of motion. So know what the top speed, what jumping at, at, you know, jumping as hard as you can while running as fast as you can lets you do. And then like part of what is so different about N++ is that you can chain things like that. So uh, a lot of people, a lot of early players have a lot of trouble wall jumping up walls because the timing matters and, you know, whether you were 
like how fast you were running when you got to the wall and what angle you started jumping on, these all matter and they all sort of combine to give you that vertical velocity that you really want. So it is pretty difficult to understand that and it really, you get a sense of it as you play, but that's one of the things that as designers we really need to know so that we can create levels that exploit that or support it or help try to teach that to players. And I think that's one of the main challenges that we've had. We did, I think, a pretty good job with the intro like tutorial levels in M++, but there are so many techniques that you, you just don't really maybe string them all together because it's a complex sequence. And if you screwed up on the first one, it really affects you know five moves down the road. So it's tough to teach that, but um, that's something that we definitely tried to do in the intro. So we just break it out into discrete steps and then hope that the player can make the leaps that they need to within the level. Cool. We'll take a few more questions. Oh, God. Um, Sorry. Um, I was really interested in your idea of like, one rated level and two rated levels and how you oscillate between the two. Do you mix them from good feeling or do you have like a, 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 a set of standards that you want to meet in terms of the amount of two that you want to have? So, we do basically go by what feels right. Um, but when we are arranging levels, we, so there's kind of two steps. You arrange five levels into an episode, and then you arrange all those episodes into the grid. And the difficulty on the grid, it's a rectangle, and it kind of goes from the top left corner to the bottom right. So it's, it's, a, it's not a constant difficulty, because one of the things about this series is that the player has a lot of options with what levels they want to play when. There are a lot of episodes that are open to them. Some of them are locked, but there's choice. They can make their own choice. So we can't really tell how a player is going to go through the game. We just have to kind of make it a good experience no matter where they start and no matter where they end. So it's actually, it, we just kind of play through it a bunch of different ways and see what feels right. So what we try to do is we have a complicated spreadsheet where we try to arrange levels, making sure that there's nothing too similar next to each other. Yeah, I didn't bring it with me, but I'll, we'll put it up on our website. Um, but yeah, we just try to pepper, like I don't think you would put more than two, two, diff or two quality levels in an episode, because that might be too many. Sometimes we use them as boss levels at the end of an episode, or sometimes they just fit better within the middle because we want to create peaks or we want we don't want ever a constantly increasing line of difficulty or quality or anything we want it to be you have peaks and valleys so that there's a compelling experience and it feels like a journey so that when you finally reach the end of it there's the satisfaction of having gotten there let's squeeze in one more question uh, right in the back Um, there's so many. Actually, we have a text file full of platformer ideas that we hope to get to someday. <laughs> but I find that the platformer genre is very rich. Like, I'm sure that's why a lot of beginning game developers use it as one of their first games, because you can do a lot with it. Um, but one thing that we tried to do with M++, and I guess the whole series, is we tried to do things that we hadn't seen before. So what I would really like is to see more platformers where your character's collision shape is a circle. And you know you don't just use um, square tiles. There are more angles and more interesting shapes that you can move around in. And we just tried to make it more fluid and there to be a lot more momentum. So we found that interesting. Like we find these physics fun and interesting because you need to learn and grow to you know, master them. So I want to see more challenging platformers like that, where you have choice and you have the ability to perform your own, you know, route through the level or, you know, where you can be yourself as a player and the game supports you in that and, you know, lets you shine. That's great. Thank you so much, Mayor. So, um, Thank you. Thank you.